It's Yorkshire Day, and what better way to celebrate than by talking about the health benefits of Yorkshire tea? First things first, I'm not sponsored by Yorkshire Tea. Yorkshire Tea just is the best tea. I like other tea, I like green tea, yellow tea, white tea, red tea, brown tea, black tea, Darjeeling tea, Assam tea, Earl Grey tea, Oolong tea, any tea, but nothing comes close to Yorkshire Tea. Having said that, the health effects of Yorkshire tea are pretty similar to any other black tea, which in all honesty is fairly similar to green tea and coffee. I'm not sure the hat really goes with the hair. What do you reckon? I think it probably suits him better. So the health effects of tea are from a mixture of natural chemicals that occur in the tea. That is, natural chemicals, yeah, that is a thing. Most of it's caused by caffeine, but there are other biologically active compounds in there, including polyphenols, which are a kind of antioxidant. We'll be talking mainly about caffeine today, but we'll talk a little bit about the others at the end. So as we all know, caffeine is a mild stimulant. It picks you up, it wakes you up, it makes you that little bit more alert. It raises your heart rate and your blood pressure a little bit. It can open up the airways in your lungs and it acts as an amplifier for painkillers like paracetamol or ibuprofen. The effects in a lot of ways are a bit like a mild shot of adrenaline, really. It affects different people in different ways and you probably know and you can probably tell by looking at your friends that some people are really much more sensitive to caffeine than others and that's a combination that some people just genetically are more sensitive to caffeine than others and also tolerance you develop tolerance to caffeine. The more you drink, the more your body just gets used to it. So you need more caffeine to get the same effect. And if you are someone that's sensitive to it, it really can cause you problems. It can cause anxiety for some people. Sometimes it can even cause the rhythm of your heart to go a little bit wrong and it can cause arrhythmias. And it's not uncommon for it to cause or amplify problems with acid reflux as well. So that makes it sound a little bit grim for the humble cuppa, but the question is, how do you balance these things? How do you balance the good and the bad? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? So let's dig a little deeper and talk about caffeine. There have been a lot of studies that have looked at the effects of caffeine over a long period of time, and there have been studies that have tried to combine these things to figure out, well, what does caffeine do for us in the long term? Is it good for us or is it bad? There are various limitations of these studies. You can't randomise how much tea or coffee someone's going to drink and say, you have to drink exactly three cups of tea a day, no more, no less, for the rest of your life so that we can see what happens doesn't work like that. You can't blind people so that they don't know how much tea or coffee they're drinking. What you have to do is either ask someone who's had a certain health outcome how much they drink in terms of caffeine and then work backwards or ideally ask someone how much they drink in terms of tea or coffee and then see what happens to them over a period of time. When you get enough of these studies that are done well enough with enough participants, you can still get a very good idea of what the consequences are of drinking caffeine or whatever else it is you might be looking at. Most of these studies have been done looking at coffee intake, but you can expect the results to be fairly similar with tea because the main ingredient that's active on your body in birth is caffeine, so they'll be fairly similar. The difference is the amount of caffeine in coffee and tea. The thing is, the amount of caffeine in coffee is really variable anyway. It depends on the variety of coffee, it depends on how it's grown, where it's grown, it depends on how it's been processed after it's been grown and even how you make the cup of coffee. Same is true of tea as well, but good rule of thumb is that even though they do vary dramatically, a cup of tea will usually contain about half the caffeine in a cup of coffee. Now that is one of the issues with the studies anyway. You obviously can't say to someone how many milligrams of caffeine do you take in a day, you say how many cups of coffee or tea do you drink. So whilst these studies are good, they've been done fairly comprehensively looking at over a million people, the exact dose of the caffeine isn't exactly certain, but we've got a clear idea of roughly more caffeine means... 
so what do the studies say? Well, most of them have looked at the effect on your cardiovascular system, looking at the effect on strokes, heart attacks, coronary heart disease, even all-cause mortality. That basically just means the number of people that die of anything over the study period. Obviously, if your study period was long enough, then everyone would die eventually, no matter how much tea you drink. But what they basically all fairly conclusively show is something called a J-shaped curve. Basically, what that means, risk of death or any other outcome on this side, amount of caffeine you drink on this side. What a J-shaped curve is, it means that it looks like a J. So, if you drink no caffeine, let's say your risk is here. As you up your caffeine intake, it drops down a little bit, and then it goes up like a J. Now the question is, does it cross over here? And does it go above? We'll get to this bit. The point is that if your risk of dying or having a heart attack or a stroke or whatever if you drink zero is there, if you drink a small amount of caffeine, one or two cups of coffee a day, it goes down. So drinking one or two cups of coffee a day is good for your health. It reduces the risk of you having a stroke or a heart attack or coronary artery disease or dying of anything over the next however many years. As you drink more, that lessens. The question is, as you drink more, does your risk go up? And that is an interesting question. So as I say, the big massive study that pulls everything together looks at over a million people. So it's a really, really big, what we call meta-analysis. I did find another big combined study that looked at over 200,000 people. And what that showed is that if you have over four cups of coffee a day, then your risk of having a heart attack actually goes up compared to if you didn't drink any coffee. And that doesn't quite fit with the other studies. So in order to piece this together and make sense of it, you need to look at why this might be happening. So the thing is, caffeine and the other chemicals in coffee and tea, they do have different effects on your body. They up your blood pressure, they up your heart rate. These things aren't good for your heart's health, but they also improve your body's ability to use insulin. That means that you have a lower risk of having type 2 diabetes. And one theory is that as you increase the amount of caffeine that you drink, then that balance changes a little bit and the benefit starts to shift to be less of a benefit or possibly when you go above four cups a day might start to be bad. But you also need to bear in mind that these aren't randomised controlled trials. They're looking at people with lives and lifestyles. And one thing that's important is something that we call confounders, confounding factors. What that means is, what a confounder is, is something that's associated with the thing that you're looking at that isn't causal. In this case, the most important one is that if you drink lots of coffee, you're more likely to be someone that smokes. If you smoke, you are much more likely to have a heart attack. So, if you drink four cups of coffee, you might be more likely to have a heart attack because you're more likely to be someone that smokes. So how do we pick that one apart? Now, this does get a little bit gritty here. Try and bear with me. One of the other interesting things that it showed is that that effect of it being dangerous above four cups was true in men, but not in women. Looking at one little bit of one of the studies, they did find that looking at men that don't smoke and do drink lots of coffee over four cups a day, don't have a worse health outcome than women that drink lots of coffee and don't smoke. What that means is that that could be just a statistical oddity that's not quite right. Or, when you fit it together with everything else, it could be that the reason that it looks like four cups a day or more in men is dangerous is because those people are more likely to smoke. 
women are less likely to smoke. The confounder is the smoking is the thing that's doing the work. There are other possible confounders as well. If you're drinking a lot of coffee, you're more likely to be someone with a sedentary lifestyle. You're less likely to do lots of exercise. They also don't look at the amount of sugar in your coffee. It's a different story if you have coffee without any sugar in to if you have coffee with three sugars in, and that's amplified the more you drink. If you're having six cups of coffee a day and you have three sugars in each one, that's a lot of sugar. So this is all getting quite complicated. What's the point? The point is that the health effects of tea and coffee are caused by a natural balance of chemicals in the tea and the coffee. That mixture of chemicals has a collection of different effects on our body and the balance of those effects varies depending on how much tea or coffee you drink. Different people have different sensitivities to caffeine. It makes some people very anxious. It gives some people palpitations. It gives some people acid reflux. If it's giving you those problems, it's not good for you and you want to cut it out or at least cut down. But for most people, two or three cups of coffee a day or twice as much tea is probably good for your heart. When you get to four or more cups of coffee a day, then the benefit is neutralized. It might be bad for you, but smoking's bad for you. Lack of exercise is bad for you. Sugar in tea or coffee is bad for you, but smoking is bad for you. Well, that's caffeine. What about the other chemicals? Well, there's a lot of stuff in tea and coffee. The other kind of main group of chemicals is called polyphenols. You might know them as antioxidants. And there's a lot of talk around with antioxidants preventing cancer. Now, the thing with antioxidants, when you're looking in a lab and you're looking at cells growing in lab conditions, antioxidants do prevent cell damage, which can lead to cancer. But our bodies have something incredible called a digestive system. And sadly, when you eat the antioxidants, you digest them and not many of them actually get into your body. So, so far, all of the studies that have looked at antioxidants haven't really shown any benefit for cancer. So, as much as I would like to say that Yorkshire tea prevents cancer, it would be a bit disingenuous of me to do so. But if you're getting too hung up on the antioxidants, I think you're really, really missing the point. Yorkshire tea is delicious. That's enough for today. Remember, if you enjoyed the video, click the like button, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel and share the links. Happy Yorkshire Day and I'll see you next week.